Hey, homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. My name is Jennifer. Welcome to Miles Away Farm. Thanks for joining me in my kitchen. Today, I am making a pumpkin pie from scratch. And this is one of those things that always intimidates new cooks, and it's actually one of the easiest things to do in terms of cooking from scratch. The hardest part, honestly, is the pie crust, not the squash. So what I have here is a sugar pie pumpkin. And so this was a pumpkin that was specifically selected for its sweetness. So it is specifically for pies. It's also very cute and a very nice decoration. But most of the ornamental pumpkins that you find at the grocery store the great big huge ones, those were not selected for sweetness. They were selected for size and for funky shapes and things like that. And so they're not really great in terms of baking. You can certainly bake with them and I've done that more than once. Um, in fact, when I was a really broke college student, I once um, picked up a broken pumpkin that somebody had smashed at Halloween and picked up the pieces and took it home and baked it and made pumpkin pie. So you could definitely bake with those. They tend to be a little bit more watery um, and not as sweet as what's called a pie pumpkin. But I'm here to also share a secret with you, which is you can make a pumpkin pie out of any kind of winter squash. It does not have to be a pumpkin. And the other thing is what we call pumpkin can actually be from any of the four different genus species of winter squash that we grow. The entire group of winter and summer squash, the genus is called curcubida, um, and they are related also to melons and cucumbers, so they're all kind of in that same family. But curcubida is the, the general genus, and then the individual species are pepo, which is most of the summer squash that we grow, also decorative gourds, and then many of the winter squash we grow, this is a pepo um, type variety, but there's a bunch of different pepos out there, including um, acorn squash, delicata squash, those are all pepo varieties. Cucurbita mochata is the butternut squashes, but there's a bunch of other squash in that group as well. And then the third one that's grown commonly all over the United States is maxima. And Maximas are things like Cinderella pumpkins, so that is a different species from the other two. I don't have great luck with Maximas here in Southeast Washington. We have squash bug issues um, in a big way. Thankfully, we do not have squash vine borers. And just so you know, squash vine borers and squash bugs are two completely different things. Um, but we do have serious squash bug issues. And in my experience, when I've tried to grow like Cinderella pumpkins or those type of pumpkins, the squash bugs get into them and the plant dies when it is still probably less than 12 inches across. So they are wildly susceptible to whatever viruses squash bugs are carrying. Uh, in my experience, butternut squash are more resistant to squash bugs than the pepo varieties. And so I've had better luck with heavy squash bug pressure with things like butternut. These do take a long time to mature though. And so you need to have a long growing season. It's very hard to pull off butternut if you've got less than a hundred day growing season because they tend to take a very long time to get ripe. And then lastly, the last species of squash that's common in the United States is um, called mixta. And mixta tends to have a super, super long growing season. And those tend to be grown primarily in the southern part of the United States because they just don't work. Um, they're too long of a growing season for most of the, the northern part of the country. And then the other thing to know about the genus species and what makes them different from each other is storage time. And so the pepo and the moschata they're generally good if the, the fruit has been picked and it's just been sitting and curing for seven to 14 days. They're usually kind of at their prime and their sweetness has come up and they're delicious. If you're talking about a uh, Maxima type of squash, they're much better if they've actually cured for a full month before you eat them. And so it's worth looking up what your genus species is on your different kinds of squash um, when you're growing them and when you're harvesting them because certain ones are going to be better the longer they store and other ones are going to be they're going to start to kind of degrade um, in their in storage and you should eat those first in terms of what's in your pantry so it helps to know the differences but you can make a pie from a butternut you can make a pie from a cinderella pumpkin you can make a pie from um, a sugar pie pumpkin and 
essentially we call pumpkin anything that is round and sort of orange um, or really even just round. And I'll put some pictures up on the screen as I'm talking here of some different varieties that um, we still call pumpkin, but they're all different varieties of genus species. It's a little confusing. It's kind of like how the grocery store calls sweet potatoes yams. Um, what we call pumpkin is actually possibly four different genus species of squash. So you can make pie out of any of them. It's going to be delicious. They're all going to have slightly different flavors, slightly different drynesses and textures. Um, I'll see if I can find it and put a link to it. There's a really cool flavor chart for squash that shows, it's like a wheel and it shows a whole bunch of different kinds of winter squash and the different subtle flavor differences between them. But pumpkin pie, super, super easy to do. And that's what we're going to show you today. And hopefully it will inspire you to make pumpkin pie for your Thanksgiving or your Christmas table. So pumpkin pie, let's get started. All right, here is my favorite way to remove the stem from a pumpkin. Ta-da. Much easier than trying to cut it off. And then this guy is kind of squat, but I'm gonna do my best to cut this in half. There she is. And you can choose to scrape the center of this out now, or you can wait until it's baked. Either system works. I like to take them out ahead of time only because I feel like maybe these seeds are gonna just provide insulation and it's gonna take longer to cook. Um, but it is actually much easier to get the center out of a squash if you just wait and bake it in there. I'm not gonna save seeds from these because um, I did not isolate these plants or isolate this particular blossom for this particular fruit. And so this is crossed with all of the other squash that I grew. And especially with the pepo varieties, which this is, um, they will cross not only with other winter squash, but they will cross with your zucchini um, and your patty pan and things like that in your garden. So um, you definitely, if you're gonna wanna save seed from squash, do a little research. And what you do is you hand pollinate and then you clip the flower blossom closed or cover it so that an insect can't get in there. So basically you need to be the bee in order to keep it from cross pollinating. And I don't generally have time to fiddle with that. And so I don't bother and I could roast these and eat them, but I actually, if I'm gonna eat pumpkin seeds, I grow the variety that are a hullus variety of pumpkin where the seeds don't have a shell on them because I find trying to, to crack and get the shell out of the way incredibly tedious, even more tedious than it is with a sunflower. So I don't tend to eat a lot of pumpkin seeds in the shell as a snack because I find it, I don't have the patience for it. Um, but you can certainly roast these if you want to. And I'm not trying to get every string out of here. This is all edible. It's There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and a lot of that is just gonna peel right out once these are baked. So depending on how wet or dry you think your pumpkin is going to be, you can cook these cut side up or cut side down. I tend to cook them cut side down because I think what happens is you get some steam in here and that actually speeds the cooking process. And so I tend to go cut side down. Um, but if I were doing something like a Cinderella pumpkin that tends to be pretty watery, I might decide to cook it cut side up just to try to dry some of that flesh out while I was baking it. So, um, but most of the time I just do cut side down. And then I've sometimes seen instructions where you fill your pan with a half an inch of water or so, and that's to keep the flesh from drying out. So kind of the opposite. Um, if you've got something that's a particularly dry pumpkin or dry fleshed um, winter squash and you don't want it to dry out more, I don't worry about that either. So I'm just gonna put these cut side down. I've got them on a, on a sheet pan. This is a piece of parchment just so that um, I don't get a lot of caramelized squash baked to my pan that I have to scrub off later. And I'm gonna stick these in a 425 degree oven and I'll check them. Um, you should be able to, when they're cooked all the way through, you should be able to pierce them from the outside with a knife and have it very easily go in. So that's how you check to see if they are cooked all the way through and done. This is 
probably going to take 45 minutes to an hour. So my timer just went off and I just checked these and they are done. Look at that beautiful baked pumpkin. And so if I take a knife, see how easily that goes in? That's done. So that's how you tell. Sometimes you'll see, you can see how the skin here is a little bit loose. The skin will sometimes pull away from the flesh. That's another indication that things are doing well. And then all of this lovely juice and a little bit of caramelization is happening here. So I'm just gonna let these sit for the next half an hour or so to cool, and then we'll get started on the rest of the pie. All right, you guys, here is our cooled baked pumpkin, and it's actually been sitting a little longer than I originally anticipated because we had some other things come up, but it's totally fine. So that's what it looks like from the other side, and I am gonna just Make sure I get some of these strings out of here and any seeds that I maybe missed. But for the most part, these are totally fine, just as they are. And you can see this is caramelized and a little bit sticky. That's from the natural sugars that are in these pumpkins. And that's something you won't necessarily see if you're just using an ornamental pumpkin rather than a pie pumpkin or a sugar pumpkin. And so I'm just gonna, and honestly, I can probably just peel this skin off. A lot of times, some of this I'm gonna have to scrape out, but it got some nice air bubble on the other side, which makes it pretty easy to peel. Now, look at that. Fantastic. And I am gonna take out this little center bit where the stem was attached. Because I know I don't want that. And just like that, we have baked pumpkin. And the skin on these is pretty tough, so you do want to make sure you get all of it. It's not going to be good eats if that's in a bit of pie. But you can use the curve of your spoon to get underneath that, and it's just going to come right off. And you can see how easy our cleanup is gonna be because we used that parchment paper. Okay, so what we have here is baked pumpkin. What we're gonna make is a pumpkin pie and a pumpkin pie is a custard. And a custard is just a fancy way of saying something that is thickened with eggs. And usually it's dairy, but you can have a custard that is made with something like chicken stock. So if you think about a uh, stuffing that goes into a turkey, that's actually a type of custard because it's uh, usually chicken stock and eggs. This is one can, 12 ounces of evaporated milk. You could use um, heavy cream for this. You could try using coconut milk for this. Um, I've actually done pumpkin pie with tofu. I've done a million variations. This is kind of the standard. What I'm basically gonna show you is the Libby's on the back of the can pumpkin pie recipe, which I have made so many times that I literally have it memorized. Um, and that starts with a can of evaporated milk. You know, for me, Growing up, pumpkin pie was one of my favorite things that went on the table, especially around Thanksgiving time. And if it wasn't made like the Libby's recipe, it didn't taste right to me. And so while I've done a million variations over the years, I keep coming back to this recipe because this to me is what I grew up with and it's what I feel like pumpkin pie should taste like. So I'm gonna measure out a pound of pumpkin and we're just gonna make this in the blender because it's much easier to turn this into a puree in the blender than it is to just mash it up in a bowl. So we're just gonna do a pound of pumpkin here. I am gonna break this up into a little bit of chunky pieces. And I'm figuring I'm probably gonna get two pies out of this pumpkin just based on past experience. And there's a difference between if you've bought canned pumpkin 
canned pumpkin is literally, if you look at the ingredients, it says ingredients, pumpkin. That's all that's in it. Um, so canned pumpkin, there's nothing wrong with just using canned pumpkin. Um, it's actually a pretty darn wholesome product. But I really like a fresh pumpkin pie, and there's something really fun about making a pie knowing that it's come from squash that you grew on your own property. So there's a pound of pumpkin. And yeah, I've got actually probably a little more than a whole nother pie here for that. And I have my oven preheating to 425. I'm also gonna need two whole eggs. These are big eggs. The chickens that I have that are still laying are older birds who are laying quite large eggs. In fact, I might do one that's a little bit smaller just to try to balance that out a little bit. So two eggs one can of evaporated milk, one pound of pumpkin. The original recipe calls for three quarters of a cup of sugar. And I'm gonna cut that down a little bit. Just, we've kind of retrained our palates to not be quite so sugar loving. And this is a pretty sweet sugar pie pumpkin anyway. So I'm just gonna do about a little over a half a cup instead of three quarters of a cup. But your mileage may vary, do what makes you happy. And then for spices, obviously you could just buy pumpkin pie spice, but pumpkin pie spice is just a combination of other spices that you probably already have in your cupboard. So I like to just do my own. Um, I am going to do a teaspoon of ground cinnamon, a half a teaspoon of ground ginger, a half a teaspoon of salt. And this is just sea salt, regular fine grain table salt, not kosher. Quarter teaspoon of ground clove, and clove is quite strong, and so you definitely don't wanna go heavier than that unless you really, really, really like cloves. And then I like to do just a pinch of allspice, so about an eighth of a teaspoon, which honestly is almost all of it I've got in there, because I like the flavor of allspice. Most pumpkin spice, spice mixes have um, nutmeg in them, and I, um, you can take or leave of nutmeg. I don't think I miss it, and so I don't put it in this. And that's all there is to this. We're just gonna mix this up in the blender. And just like that, you have pumpkin pie filling. It's that simple. All right, this is a pie crust that I pre-made with mostly shortening a little bit of butter, all-purpose flour, and salt. And if you want a rant on pie crust, and not getting too wrapped around the axle about making pie crust, refer to the video in the link. I think people worry about it way too much. Um, there are better ways and not so good ways to do it, but I honestly think homemade pie crust almost always tastes better than a store-bought pie crust, even if you mess it up. I really dislike store-bought pie crust. I think they're terrible. And there's nothing more disappointing than for me to go to a potluck or a holiday party and somebody has a beautiful pie and then the pie crust is store-bought and I can taste that it's store-bought and it just completely ruins it for me. So I am definitely a purist when it comes to homemade pie crust, even if you don't do it perfectly. So I'm gonna roll this out to fit a nine inch pie pan and I'm doing it between a couple of pieces of parchment just because I think it's much easier to do it between parchment in terms of moving it than it is to do it um, just on a countertop or on a silicone mat. But I've done it that way for many years, so it's certainly doable to do it that way. Um, one of the tricks to pie crust is to roll from the center out instead of all the way across. Get a little bit more even spread that way. And I'm aiming for round, and so in places where I can see it starting to get a little more square, I'm trying to even that out as I go. And then just to make sure that this isn't sticking on this side, I'm gonna go ahead and flip that. You know what, maybe I'll just lose the top there so I can see what I'm doing a little better. One of the biggest keys to doing pie crust is to um, do it ahead of time and let the puck sit in the fridge and hydrate um, for at least an hour. It makes a huge difference in terms of how easy or difficult it is to roll out because what makes a pie crust tough is too much water 
but what makes a pie crust really hard to roll out is not enough water. And so if you let that flour hydrate in the fridge for an hour before you try to roll it, it's gonna be the best of both worlds. Looks like I am a little bit dry and thin here in the middle, so hopefully that's not a problem. Pretty good. I like to just set it down and eyeball it in terms of size. Getting a little bit of cracking there. I'm trying to keep everything fairly cool. And then to transfer this, this is the old trick, which is to roll it onto your rolling pin so that it's supported. And so that you're not picking it up a great distance with a lot of weight. We'll see how I do. This is not the most perfect pie crust I've ever made. I did not get that centered as well as I could have. So we're having mild technical difficulty here. Moisture is your friend if you're repairing tears. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna trim this overhang and move it to the other side. Part of my don't overthink, don't overstress on pie crust is also like let it go that it has to look like something out of Sunset Magazine or Martha Stewart. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. It just has to be delicious. So we're just gonna do a little bit of repair there. Not my best work. A little more fiddly than I wanted it to be. Okay, so in order to do a high fluted edge, we're just gonna roll this as best we can without getting overly stressed about it. So we're gonna work our way around. And honestly, if you guys are more comfortable with store-bought pie crust and you just don't wanna hassle with this, that's fine. You do you, man. Just because I am weird about store-bought pie crust does not mean that you need to not ever buy a store-bought pie crust. If I'm gonna buy a store-bought, which I do on occasion, I do like the frozen ones better than I like the Pillsbury rollout ones. I think the flavor is better on them. But hey, we all only have so many brain cells and so many hours in the day. So I feel you, do what you need to do. All right, I'm just gonna go around and kind of pinch this into a little bit of a flute just for visual appeal. There we go. Not perfect, but certainly acceptable. So we've got our pie crust. Our oven is preheated to 425. My rack is closer to the bottom than the top. What we want when we first put this in the oven is a lot of bottom heat. It's gonna take about an hour altogether for this pie to cook. And you really want that first 15 minutes to have a big push of heat so that it helps set that crust so that it isn't soggy. Um, you can blind bake this, which means baking it ahead of time and then putting the filling in. Um, for whatever reason, I think because pumpkin pie takes so long to cook, that's rare that you see that in a recipe and I mostly never do it. I've tried it. Um, it does give a slightly crisper crust, but it's also a whole extra step and a lot of fiddly. And so not something that I regularly do. All right, we're gonna just pour our filling into our crust. Look how beautiful that is, you guys. Everything's nicely mixed. It's not lumpy. And we have plenty of room for whipped cream around the edges. This is gonna puff up a lot, so. Into the oven, this goes for 15 minutes, and then we're gonna turn the oven down to 350 after 15 minutes. All right, I'm gonna turn this down to 350. And I'm gonna show you really quick without letting too much heat out what we're looking like. So there's our pie so far. And we're gonna need to cook this for at least another 40 minutes. So we'll see how we do. All 
All right, you guys, this pie is chilled and this is hysterical. I put it out on my back porch because it's about 40 degrees out there and I thought it would cool off faster. And this is what happens when you do that and you have cats. <laughs> So somebody decided to um, taste the pie and see how they liked it. So guess what? The, the thumbnail picture for this video is not going to include the entire pie. <laughs> but other than that, we are ready to serve. And you can see how our pie crust is shattering, which is a good sign that it's got some flake to it and it's not super tough. And we will eat around the cat part. We have four cats. It makes me wonder which one did that. That's really funny. Ah, oh, look at that. Beautiful. So hopefully you can see this bottom crust on here is fully cooked and not soggy. That's what you're looking for. And it's because this cooked for another 40 minutes um, after we did that 15 minute initial cook that is why that crust is able to not be pre-baked. And as I said, we eat pumpkin pie from about September or at least October through about March. So we eat a lot of pumpkin pie. This is definitely one of our favorite pies. And we also are under the illusions that it's semi-healthy because it's made out of squash, which helps justify the indulgence. <laughs> And I'm gonna leave this one for my husband. We have a little cranberry sauce over here. And he last year, or maybe the year before, discovered that he really, really likes pumpkin pie with cranberry sauce over the top. And I didn't put it over the whole pie because I wanted to take a picture, but I'm sure he's gonna have some of that on his pie. So there you have it, homemade pumpkin pie. Honestly, not a whole lot of extra work beyond cutting that pumpkin in half and scraping out the seeds and then peeling it once it's baked. We're talking less than 10 minutes of actual additional work. And out of that one pumpkin that we had, I got enough pumpkin for two pies plus another additional cup that I can put into muffins or something. So instead of buying a can of pumpkin, I grew a whole pumpkin and I got two pies out of it. So beautiful and fresh and delicious and healthy, um, at least not in terms of the sugar, but at least in terms of the squash. So give homemade pumpkin pie a try. It is definitely worth doing. You do not have to make the crust from scratch if that is not your jam, but the actual pie very, very easy. And again, remember, you can do it out of sugar pie pumpkins. You can do it out of butternut squash. You can do it out of whatever squash you have sitting around, and it's probably going to come out delicious. So give it a try, tribe. Okay, so this is what happens when you forget to turn the camera on. Joy. Um, this is round two of pumpkin pie. And so I've got the exact same beginning as the other recipe. So this is a can of uh, evaporated milk, not sweetened condensed milk, but evaporated milk, two eggs, and one pound of pumpkin from our pumpkin. And then to this, I have added a third of a cup of brown sugar. The original recipe calls for um, a half a cup, but I backed off on that a little bit because my pumpkin is quite sweet and I don't want quite that much sugar. So a third of a cup of brown sugar, uh, three tablespoons of molasses, and now I'm adding the second of three tablespoons of bourbon and you could use bourbon, you could use whiskey, you could use rye. I think spiced rum would also be quite good in this, or you could choose to go with a liqueur, so like a triple sec or something like that could be also quite good. And then the spice on this is a little bit more subtle. All right, so we're just gonna blend this together and put this in our pie crust. I did a little better job with the pie crust on this one. And I just recently picked up this stoneware 
pie pan from an estate sale. So this is the first time I baked in it. It's probably gonna take a little longer to heat. So I'm expecting this to take a little bit longer to cook and it's slightly smaller. So this filling is gonna fill this a little bit more than our last pie. And that's okay, because we were probably a little light on the last one. So this is gonna be delicious. All right, Tribe, it's been 40 minutes. Let's take a look at this pie. Oh, very nice. And what I'm looking for here is a knife to come out completely clean. Yeah, not quite. I think I'm gonna give that another five minutes. That's better. Creamy and delicious, but not undercooked. So there you have it, round two of making a pumpkin pie from scratch. This one with some molasses, some brown sugar, a little bit of bourbon, nutmeg, which was not in the first one, and then backed off a little bit on the spices in general, but just as delicious and a nice alternative. Custard pies are super, super easy, and you can bake that big squash off and then just divvy it up into freezer bags and stash it in your freezer, and you can be making pumpkin pies like I am and making them all the way into March. Thanks for watching, Tribe. If you like this kind of content, give me a thumbs up, subscribe, Share and leave me a comment. I have new content coming out every week.